perspective that even with the science of Hadith, dubious reports were still being circulated and misused in order to galvanize a plethora of different motives in early Muslim societies. Um, academics, knowing that was the terrain from which traditional scholarship of Hadith was birthed, seemed more optimistic in separating the wheat from the chaff when, dis when determining the historicity of Hadith reports, at least at that early stage. And then, as you have mentioned, it was from the critical engagement with Muslim scholarly tradition that gave rise to Western academic scholarship. Uh, and that'll probably be the last time I say Western, because in your article, I believe you laid out a really good methodology for, um, or the terms that should be used. Um, instead of Western academic, we should just say academic, because there are Muslims who are involved in the academic um, uh, re uh, study of Islam, and they do not live in Western countries. Um, but okay, so I just wanted to make that caveat. Um, and as you mentioned, it was from a critical engagement with uh, Muslim scholarly tradition that gave rise to Western academic scholarship on the subject. But in the late 19th century, Ignaz Goldzeher published Mohammedan Studies. I actually haven't read the first volume, but I read the second volume, and it totally blew my mind with all the sectarian disputes um, that were, um, you know, how Hadith were being used as a vehicle to leverage sectarian disputes. Uh, I found that to be very interesting. But in the late 19th century, Ignaz Goldzeher published Mohammedan Studies, and in the first half of the 20th century, Joseph Schott published origins of Mohammedan jurisprudence, which were both instrumental in shattering whatever optimism, at least shattering at the time, whatever optimism was had in what could be known historically from Hadith literature. Got that out the way. So my question is this, what were these work, why were these works so influential in the academic study of Hadith? And how exactly were Hadith received in the time before these two monumental works? I asked that question because one book that resonates with me is um, uh, The History of uh, Muslim Spain by uh, Renhard Dozy. I hope I said his name correctly. Uh, and it seems the way that he used Hadith, I believe that book was written in 1859, the way that he used Hadith, it was almost as if he uh, believed him and he used it as a part uh, in order to construct the history. Uh, but it seems like maybe uh, 50 years later, around 50 years later with Ignaz Gozaher, um, a lot of suspicion had been thrown on uh, the Hadith corpus um, all the way until shot. Uh, yeah, so prior to, to Gold's here, uh, um, academic scholars uh, of, of Islam, but by then also very much Western scholars. So at that, that point, it, it is still very much a separated uh, tradition. Um, but they uh, noticed that not uh, everything that was reported of the prophet was likely to be true. So they did notice um, tendencies uh, in, in the uh, reports uh, that favored specific uh, groups or individuals. Um, they also uh, were skeptical of, ever, of any miraculous stories uh, that, that uh, were around. Uh, so they, but they assume that um, with a critical mind, you can discover these tendencies and then the, the rest more or less uh, is likely to be authentic. So you would be able to retrieve the historical kernel uh, of the reports uh, by knowing about the tendencies that were going on and eliminating uh, ten uh, ten, um, I think that that was favoring specific tendencies. And Gonsi was the first to systematically look at the debates and particular uh, political, uh, to some degree theological uh, debates and say, um, we can find these later debates reflected in the hadith mm. uh, and um, that that means we can't uh, trust them at all they cannot go back to uh, Muhammad Muhammad cannot have said anything about that and because um, uh, the, uh, the critical uh, traditional Muslim scholarship wasn't able to sift that out um, we have to be much, much more critical with that rather than accept anything which we can see with a tendency. Um, so that, that was one major blow and many people then uh, in, in uh, academic studies of Islam were very careful in, in using that in, in order not to seem uh, too uh, gullible. Uh, 
uh, and uh, possibly even a uh, um, more important uh, study was uh, that by uh, Joseph uh, Schacht, which you mentioned uh, on the origins of Islamic law, where he uh, looked at particular legal traditions uh, and um, showed that they contain many contradictions. Mm. And he developed uh, a theory, not necessarily uh, or with, with um, exceptional good evidence, but uh, he um, brought up some ideas that were broadly accepted. So he noticed that there were reports uh, of later legal scholars to a certain point uh, and similar reports by uh, then some companions of Muhammad and likewise prophetic hadith mm. to the same effect. And he argued if there was a prophetic hadith around at the time when the companions or the later uh, legal scholars made their points, they wouldn't have uh, needed to say, well, this is my opinion, uh, because there was a tradition of the prophet around. Mm -hmm. So he argued that means at the point when uh, the later scholars said, this is their opinion, the prophetic hadith uh, can't have existed. Mm -hmm. And so if we see that um, we have uh, similar reports, sometimes going back to a companion or even a successor a generation uh, later, and sometimes to the prophet. The one going back to the prophet is younger and is a later edition. Once it became uh, the, the main um, argument that only prophetic hadith uh, are, uh, or prophetic hadith are more authoritative than hadith are relating just to later generations. And uh, that is a discussion that probably began in the second century and then uh, was uh, very, much, um, uh, very much promoted by Ashafi uh, in his uh, discussion about the legal uh, theory underlying Islamic law. Uh, he said that the Sunnah of the Prophet, so what is reported uh, of what the Prophet said and did, that this is second in authority uh, only to the Quran. And that a report by a later scholar or by what some successor or companion uh, did does not amount to the same authority. Uh, and so that um, his argument was that only once that was established uh, did the uh, widespread use of only prophetic hadith, hadith uh, become so important. And that's why many of them were invented only at that time. Uh, and um, that reports going back to, um, to later times are probably in his view more authentic than the ones going back to the prophet. Uh, you know, looking at uh, the Muwatta by Imam Malik, uh, Kitab al-Athar uh, by Abu Hanifa, even though it was by his, uh, one of his students, um, I, I see that in um, the reports that they have in their books, that very few of them go back to the Prophet, or at least more go back to companions and successors of companions than what you see going back to the Prophet. Um, and it was actually reading Joseph Schock's um, uh, Muhammadan jurisprudence or on uh, Islamic law that um, he brought this to my attention after I had noticed it reading the Muwatta and Kitab al Athar. Um, but it, uh, how relevant is his work today? Because I understand some people said he was working with limited sources, um, translations weren't as uh, prevalent as they are now, and he might have got a few things wrong. Now, was the, what he had um, hypothesized about Shafi'i? taking a lot of uh, Hadith reports back to the Prophet. I don't know if Shafi is responsible, but it seems like he created that culture. Um, um, what, was he right about that or, or wrong about that? Was that an outdated theater, theory or was he spot on? Um, so he didn't claim that Ashafi uh, brought them back to the Prophet, but that with um, Ashafi's promotion of the idea that uh, prophetic Hadith is actually uh, almost as important as the Quran, uh, um, he was kind of responsible of, uh, for 
people um, trying to find prophetic hadith rather than relying on later authorities. And his claim is that, uh, then that that uh, led to a huge amount of invention of new prophetic traditions. Mm. Um, yeah, he, he also uh, looked at some other features uh, of the uh, Isnats. Um, I think it, um, it very much um, defined a lot of um, academic scholarship on hadith in the following uh, decades. Mm. Uh, and the general principle that um, the importance of prophetic hadith became more after, after Ashafi. Uh, that, that's something that uh, I would say most uh, academic scholars would agree. Mm. That doesn't mean that they necessarily were invented. Uh, it just, there was a focus then to sift out the uh, prophetic hadith and those that were allegedly uh, authentic in the major hadith collections uh, than in the uh, ninth uh, and 10th centuries. Um, and um, the, the, I think uh, what he was certainly wrong is, is the generalization of his observation. Mm. Um, so that um, just because more prophetic hadith were invented after this debate, and uh, he very much linked it to Ashafi, we know, know it's, it's uh, earlier, Ashafi is not the first to advance uh, that idea. Mm. Um, but um, so while acknowledging that uh, lots of hadith will have been forged after that, that doesn't mean that any hadith we have is necessarily forged. Okay. It could still be uh, that there is authentic stuff uh, amongst that. Uh, and likewise, um, if we have a tradition that is traced back to a later scholar as well as to the prophet, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be invented. That is one possible uh, explanation. Uh, so another thing he, he um, used as a general principle is to say, um, to establish the authentic authenticity of the prophetic sunnah, the hadith uh, not only needs to go back to the prophet, that's quite clear, but it also needs to be uninterrupted uh, and widely uh, spread. Uh, and so um, Schacht's conclusion was that a hadith that did not follow um, uh, these criteria so that uh, did not meet these criteria so that were had uh, only partial is not not complete is not or where people were unknown in between that these are actually older mm. more authentic because after the establishment that you have to have an authentic uh, an established authentic hadith going back to the prophet no one would have invented these um hadith with, with more problematic isnats. Mm, makes sense, definitely makes sense. And uh, yeah, I think the, the general ideas that he advanced are still widely uh, accepted, but not uh, in the general sense that this applies to all hadith. And for him, this not only applied to legal hadith where he, um, where he basically did his uh, own uh, research, but for him that applied to all hadith historical and uh, exegetical as well. So they were all the same. And um, th that's likewise something that uh, not every scholar would agree. You know, I think maybe some Ibadis might feel Joseph Schacht was wrong about um, his characterization of their school. Um, as something about not a lot of Ibadi sources were available when he came out with his book and um, something like he believed that they just basically took from Sunni jurisprudence. Uh,